Virgil's Aeneid plays with earlier poetry in intertextual ways. He gets meta. He recycles some elements, he upcycles others. When he wrote his great epic in 12 books, the Aeneid, towards the end of the 1st century BCE, he had access to a range of earlier epic material, and he makes full use of it. Uh, Homer, Apollonius of Rhodes, Roman epic poets like Aeneas and Lucretius, and other, and other genres as well. My question today is, does he do this with the epic cycle too? And the answer is, kind of. There's no doubt Virgil was aware of the cycle, and some parts of the Aeneid are obviously designed to take advantage of cyclic material. Most of the metagame gets played with Homer. Virgil lampshades this right from the start of the Aeneid. I sing of arms and the man, arma virumque carno. That's, this foreshadows major themes in the same way that the Iliad does with the word wrath and the Odyssey does with the word man. Arms and the man, Iliad and Odyssey. After this opening, Virgil quickly moves into a storm sequence that plays on a storm in Odyssey Book 5. Uh, he recycles a character from Odyssey Book 10, Aeolus. Uh, there's an investigation of an unknown land playing on Odyssey Book 13. Um, Aeneas meets Venus disguised as a, as a huntress, again mirroring Odyssey 13. Uh, but then Venus's role shifts to that of Nausicaa in Odyssey Book 6. That leads to the arrival at Carthage. Uh, there's a bee simile that plays on bee similes in the Iliad and in Apollonius. Dido hosts a feast which plays simultaneously on Odyssey 8 at the Phaeacian court and Argonautica Book 3 uh, at the Colchian court. In Apollonius, the goddesses conspire to send Eros to make Medea fall in love with Jason. Here, Venus and Juno conspire to send Cupid to make Dido fall in love with Aeneas. And at the end of Book 1, Aeneas is asked to recount his story, echoing Odysseus at the Phaeacian court. Now, this is just Book 1. Obviously, Virgil is doing a lot more than just imitating older poems. It's the way that he synthesizes this intertextual material with his own story and his own thematic aims that makes the Aeneid what it is. Still, at some level, at least, you can see Aeneid Book 1 as a mashup of scenes from the Odyssey and the Argonautica. The question is, does he do this with the epic cycle too? Now, the epic cycle was a group of uh, eight early Greek epics which, taken together, formed a complete narrative of the Trojan War. Six of them are lost, and the other two are the Homeric Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, nowadays, the status of the epic cycle is an odd mix of being underrated and overrated. Underrated in that there are no other lost epics that we know nearly as much about. But also overrated in the sense that fans of the epic cycle these days often seem to have an overblown idea of its status and influence. If um, I'll, I'll, I will walk you through the content of the lost epics, just in case you haven't come across them before or in case you've forgotten. But right now, I want to signal that a large part of my focus today relates to the question of when the poems were lost. Eight epics, as I mentioned. Uh, the Cupria covered everything from the wedding of Thetis, mother of, of Achilles, up to the start of the Iliad. The Iliad, I assume you know, at, at some level at least. Then you've got the Aethiopus, which covered two major episodes, the arrival of Penthesilea and her Amazons, and her death and then the arrival of Memnon and his Aethiopes, and his death, all killed, both killed by Achilles, and then the death of Achilles. Uh, the Little Iliad covered several prophecies that had to be fulfilled before Troy could fall, uh, such as the theft of the Palladium, the fetching of Philoctetes, the building of the wooden horse. Then you've got the Sack of Ilian, which is the actual destruction of Troy. The Returns is the homecomings of the major Greek heroes, or deaths, except for Odysseus, who gets a whole epic to himself. And lastly, the, the Telegony is another two-episode structure, which provides groundwork for cult sites devoted to Odysseus and his family in Italy and in northwest Greece. Now, there's no doubt that Virgil was aware of the cycle. Some parts of the Aeneid are obviously designed to take advantage of cyclic material, and here are some of the more obvious candidates. Book two is the big one in the first half of the Aeneid, uh, where Aeneas tells the story of the fall of Troy. Uh, now, Virgil and his audience were aware that there, there did exist an epic on the sack of Ilion uh, in the epic cycle. There's no doubt he's trying to recapture it, outdo it, adapt it for his own purposes. 
Uh, but we don't know how closely he does this, since we don't have the earlier epic. Most of the rest of books 1 to 6 draw on Homer and Apollonius, as you can see here. See here I've highlighted a couple of other candidates. But really it's in the second half of the Aeneid uh, that we get the, big the other big sequences that use cyclic material. Book 7 uh, has the first stir stirrings of conflict between the Trojans and Latins, and conflict is kicked off when Ascanius shoots a deer while hunting. And after that, we get a catalogue of the Latins and their allies, um, Aeneas's enemies, in the war. This is mirroring the Cypria, which has the beginnings of the conflict between the Greeks and Trojans. And then at Aulus, Agamemnon shoots a deer while hunting. And in the surviving summary of the Cypria, um, the summary closes with a catalogue of the Trojans and their allies. So, hey presto, Aeneid Book 7. Uh, later on, in books 10 and 11, uh, Virgil's intertextual target is the Aethiopus. Now, that poem, the Aethiopus, was framed around two episodes, as I said, Achilles fighting Penthesilea and her Amazons, and then Memnon and his Aethiopes. Well, in the Aeneid, we have Mesentius and Camilla in two adjacent episodes, uh, which mirror them in reverse order. How closely? Again, we can't tell directly. But the bracket that Virgil places around Mesentius and Camilla and the parallelisms between them indicate that it's not a chance resemblance. Now, you have to understand, Virgil is never slavish. He doesn't copy, he uses. Mesentius and Camilla are very distinct, uh, novel, creative characters with rich backstories. And these backstories don't appear to be based on anything cyclic. Camilla is the more straightforward one. Uh, in book 11. Virgil calls her an Amazon. He explicitly compares her to Penthesilea. Uh, even without that, the presence of a woman in battle, not to mention having an Aristea, a, a rampage on the battlefield, uh, that's distinctive enough that any, re any reader is going to be thinking of Penthesilea. Uh, a big difference is that Camilla gets killed by a relatively minor hero, Arons, uh, unlike Penthesilea, who's killed by Achilles. Why Arons and not Aeneas? Well, Virgil has some solid reasons for that. First, he needs to hold Aeneas back in reserve for the battle with Turnus in Book 12. Uh, second, Arons is important because he contributes to the ethnic agenda of Books 7 to 12. Arons is very, very, very Etruscan. His name is rich in connotations of early Rome and early Etruria. In Virgil's hands, the future Rome is going to be a multicultural melting pot, straddling Trojan and Arcadian, Latin and Sabine, but also both sides of the Tiber, Latin and Etruscan. So that's why Arons uh, is, is highlighted in this way, or one of the reasons why Arons is highlighted. Book 10, with Mesentius, is more complex. Now, this is partly because Virgil's source material was already intertextual. Uh, scholars on uh, of neo-analysis, the study of the relationship between Homer and the epic cycle, uh, particularly uh, Laura Slatkin, have uh, extensively explored the close links between the Iliad and the Aethiopus, and you can see part of the links in the first two columns of this table. When Virgil comes to the same material, his echoes have to shift around. When Turnus kills Pallas, and sends Aeneas into a berserk rage, he's playing Hector, killing Patroclus in the Iliad, and sending Achilles into a berserk rage, but he is also playing Memnon, killing Antilochus in the Aethiopus, again sending Achilles into a berserk rage. But in Homer and the Epic Cycle, Hector and Memnon didn't have plot armour, Turnus does, so Virgil has to keep Turnus alive. He whisks him away safely, to come back later on in Book 12. And it's at that point in Book 10 that Mesentius takes over as the antagonist. Uh, he takes on the role of, of Memnon, because from this point to the end of Book 10, we're, we are in Aethiopus territory, we are not in Iliadic territory. In the Iliad, Hector's dominance on the battlefield ends with Patroclus's death. Mesentius carries on. His, uh, his Aristea, his rampage, mirrors Memnon, it does not mirror Hector. In other words, uh, Virgil splits Mem Memnon's role between Turnus in the first part of Book 10 and Mesentius in the last part. 
To do that, he has to build up Mezentius as a threat, and he does that by going for an archaizing threat. Commentators like to point out the high density of similes in Mezentius's Aristea, four similes and 80 lines, uh, the fact that Virgil implicitly compares Mezentius to Achilles. Stephen Harrison's commentary on Book 10 argues that these features establish Mezentius, uh, quote, establish him as a mighty hero of the traditional Homeric type. That's, that's the function, one of the functions of these similes. Uh, Mezentius is cast as brutal and violent, contemptuous of the gods. Uh, but then after he sees his son dead at Aeneas's hands, uh, he becomes more sympathetic and admirable. That's, that's all, again, quoting Harrison. The long and short of it is that we can be confident Virgil knew that the epic cycle existed and that he was aware of some elements of its content. Uh, some things that point that way are, first, the sack of Troy, Aeneid 2, Ascanius shooting the deer, Aeneid 7, the references, the explicit references to Penthesilea, Book 11. But we can't tell exactly how Virgil is echoing the cyclic poems. Uh, back in the uh, mid-1900s, Edward Frankel thought that there was a careful intertextuality between Virgil's Camilla and the Penthesilea of the Aethiopus. Uh, more recent scholars have, uh, Vir Virgil scholars have stepped back from that. Lee Fratantuono, Fr Fr except that he's drawing on the on Penthesilea in some fashion, but we don't really know how. Uh, by contrast, Nicholas Horsfall won't even accept that Virgil had Penthesilea in mind at all when he wrote Camilla, even though he mentions Penthesilea explicitly. Who's right? Well. Uh, like Frankel, I think Virgil clearly meant to play on the Aethiopus, but, like Horsfall, I don't believe he ever read it. Let's think about what the cycle itself looks like. For us, we don't have the poems. Our knowledge mostly comes from a series of plot summaries. Uh, they're attributed to a writer named Proclus. We don't know who this Proclus was for sure, but it's clear um, that he copied the summaries out of a source that probably dated to the Hellenistic era or the early Roman era. And these summaries uh, can be supplemented from the library attributed to Apollodorus, similar time period. Uh, these two summaries, Proclus and Pseudo Apollodorus, they're so close together that M. L. West's Lerb edition of the cycle actually splices them together as a single text. So this is what we have to work with. What did Virgil have to work with? Fans of the epic cycle tend to gloss over the question of when the poems were lost. Uh, it often seems that people take it for granted that they were prestigious works of literature, prominent until late antiquity. We don't have actually any reason to think that. Everyone knows we've lost many, many literary works from antiquity, but the loss of books didn't suddenly begin with the fall of Rome, and the fall of the Western Empire, I should say, or even with the transition from scroll format to codex format. And earlier than that... The instant a book was published, it started to disappear. In some cases, we have good reason to see even high-profile literary works literary works being lost quite early. Uh, think, for example, of Aristotle's Poetics Book Two, the only person in antiquity who we can be absolutely certain read it uh, with 100% confidence is Aristotle himself. Not a single other writer ever claims even to be aware of it. So when we think about how Virgil drew on the epic cycle, we're not just thinking about how he adapted it or which bits he adapted, we're thinking about whether he even ever read it. Uh, now, it is possible the cycle survived to Virgil's time. Pausanias, who was writing two centuries later, he claims that he's read the Cypria, the Little Iliad, and the Returns. Nicholas Horsfall discuss, discusses this, he refuses to believe a word of it, but even supposing we allow Pausanias' testimony, even if he did read it, he's unique. No other writer gives a clear sign that they've personally read any of the cycle, not after the time of Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle is the latest author who we can be 100% certain read the cycle, or read any of it. Um, I suggest that even if Pausanias, in the 2nd century CE, even if Pausanias had access to parts of the cycle, it may have been rather hard to come by by that time. And there are an, a number of points to consider to support this. First, when um, Proclus quotes his Hellenistic or Roman source as saying that 
literary standards of the day didn't prize the cycle for its poetic qualities, but for its thorough and continuous narration of the Trojan War. In other words, the poems themselves were not prized. People were not learning them in school. Second, we don't have a single papyrus fragment of any part of the cycle. We've got about 60 papyrus fragments of the Hesiodic Catalogue of Women. That's lost. The cycle? Nada. Nothing. Not a sausage. People weren't reading it. And third, there's some reason to believe that the summaries that we have are precisely the form in which the cycle was available in the first century BCE. Now, this is akin to a suggestion made by Erich Beta back in the 1920s that Proclus and Apollodorus both derive from a mythological handbook, uh, and that summaries of that kind are the form in which the cycle existed. The poems themselves were extinct, or rare at least. Beta's suggestion has been criticised, but you know the criticisms relate more to the specifics than the general notion. Uh, this idea of a handbook of summaries of myths was taken up uh, by Kurt Weitzman in the 1950s in his classic study of ancient book illumination. Now, Weitzman's book deserves some criticism too. He uh, assigns primacy to literature. He always treats art as dependent on uh, literature. Uh, and, and that's very much a no-no, uh, these days at least. Uh, but people who are interested in literature will still find his book worth reading. For Trojan War stories, Weitzman focused on two sets of pictorial representations in particular. First was a set of Megarian Homer cups, Homer cups, which uh, date to the 3rd to the 1st centuries BCE. And secondly, uh, the Iliac tablets, or tabulae Iliacae. Uh, these are Roman in origin, but inscribed in Greek. Uh, <clears throat> I'll focus on the Iliac tablets here. Here's, here's the most famous one, the Capital, Capitoline tablet. And like most of the tablets, it's believed that it dates to roughly sometime around the time of Virgil. One of the most striking things about the tablets is the sheer amount of text they have. There's a definite sense of interplay between the pictorial and the literary. Uh, in this tablet, the pillar at centre-right has a long prose summary of the Iliad in tiny, tiny writing. And this goes with the pictures on the right-hand side, which relate to Iliad uh, books 13 to 24. The left side of the tablet is lost. That would have had books 1 to 12. And then down below, underneath the centre, you've got more inscriptions which refer to specific poems, not just the Iliad, but parts of the epic cycle as well. Now, that's not to say that this is an illustration of liter literary works. This is a virtuosic piece in its own right. Uh, not just the sheer scale of its conception, but its physical size. Uh, you might be surprised to hear that this tablet is just 28 centimetres across, slightly over 11 inches. Uh, this writing, <laughs> these, fig these figures are tiny. No one is consulting this as a guide to the Iliad. Sorry, something went wrong with the slide there. <clears throat> No one's consulting this as a guide to the Iliad. Um, as Michael Squire's book on the tablets puts it, this is not the Iliad, it's the Iliad in a nutshell. The miniaturization is part of the point. Uh, here's the lower part of the tablet where we have, where you can see headings that tell us what stories we're looking at, and they, they cite specific poems. The Iliad, the Aethiopus, and the Little Iliad. Here you've got uh, where the tablet refers to the Iliad. Yeah, here's the Aethiopus by Arctinus, and here's the Little Iliad by Leskes. Uh, <clears throat> now, this tablet probably did originate uh, in Augustan Rome, and that helps clarify that th there was knowledge of the epic cycle floating around in some form or other, just not necessarily the original text of the poems. And even here in the tablets, uh, there are some telltale clues that the makers of the tablets weren't really invested in the actual poems themselves. Look at this heading, the Iliu Persis, the, the sack of Ilion at the, at the top. Look who it's attributed to, Stesichorus, did not write the sack of Ilion. He wasn't even an epic poet. And some of the other Iliac tablets also show that the cycle was prized, in some sense, in the Augustan period, but, again, there are telltale clues that it wasn't the poems themselves 
that were prized. Here's the New York tablet, which refers to the Homeric epics. It also refers to the sack of Ilion. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got the uh, Sartis tablet, which uh, mentions the same poems. It also tells us how many books each epic had. Uh, it seems to be laid out similarly to the Capitoline tablet, with each book of the Iliad uh, illustrated down the side. And you've got the sack of Troy in the center. Underneath, uh, you can see part of, you can see half of Achilles' shield uh, in the middle there. Uh, here's the uh, the Tabula Vernensis II. Uh, it has scenes from the Iliad, the Aethiopus, and the sack of Ilion in three columns. Uh, sorry, five columns. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, you've got a, yeah, you know, just read what it says on the slide. Column one is the Iliad panels, second and third columns are Aethiopus, text and panels, and then columns four to five are uh, Sack of Ilium, text and panels. Uh, and lastly, we've got the Thierry tablet, which mentions the Little Iliad and also Penthesilea and Memnon from the Aethiopus. Uh, and on the other side, it has, or rather had, it's lost, it had the Sack of Ilion on the other side. Now, there are a couple of tells here. First, some of the tablets take care to re record how many books each poem had. And that doesn't seem the most obvious thing to say about them, but it does reflect what we find in Proclus. Uh, in Proclus's summaries, each poem is headed with the number of books it had. And second, though these tablets are an inter an interaction between the literary and the pictorial, it's absolutely clear that the literary text is not the central interest here. Look at the spelling, if you can read Greek. It's phonetic. In the Augustan period, the letters, the Greek letters eta, iota, and the combination epsilon, iota, they were all pronounced e, as in modern Greek. Inscriptions, and even literary poetry of the time, routinely treat these as interchangeable. Now, this inscription was made by someone who spoke Greek perfectly well but who wasn't acquainted with the text of the poems where the spelling reflected the archaic pronunciation. Uh, it's the same thing back in the Capitoline, Capitoline tablet. <clears throat> the artist knew what was in the Iliad and the cycle, but he doesn't seem to have read them. The spellings are not the spellings that you would have found in poems written in the 6th century BCE. These are 1st century spellings. Uh, at the bottom left, we've got Aeneas, uh, pronounced Aeneas in the Greek of the time. Bottom right, we've got the classical um, Poseidon, written using the uh, sorry Poseidon, written using the contemporary pronunciation Poseidon. And at top right, we've got Tikos for classical Tikos. Uh, the one at the top left, I think, is the biggest tell of them all. Uh, the wooden horse it is written uh, Durios Ipos. Uh, rather than the classical pronunciation, dureios hippos. And now this is interesting because not just the pronunciation, but also the choice of words is a tell. When Homer refers to the wooden horse in the Odyssey, um, twice in Odyssey Book 8, he calls it the durateos hippos. And durateos hippos fits the rhythm of epic hexameter just fine. Dureos hippos does not, in order as Dureos hippos. Whatever Leskes, the poet of the uh, the sack of Ilion, whatever he called, sorry, the little Iliad, whatever he called the wooden horse, he did not call it this. But we do find the same choice of words with Dureos, uh, also used in, guess where, the summaries. Both Proclus and Pseudo Apollodorus use this phrase, dureos or durios ipos. So this is a very clear case of both the spelling and the choice of words pointing at contemporary summaries, not at the original poetic text. Now, uh, this isn't a rock-solid case. We don't have direct evidence that the cyclic epics weren't available in Augustan Rome. Uh, it, it could be that when Horace's when Horace writes in the art of poetry, don't begin your poem like this, like the cyclic writer of old, it may be that he was thinking of a, a poem that he had read. Maybe, maybe Virgil has the Aethiopus in mind when, uh, for example, when Lausus leaps in an, 
Aeneas's way to protect his father Mezentius. In Book 10, maybe Narsus is playing the role of Antilochus, leaping in Memnon's way to protect his father, Nestor. Maybe. Even if they are, Virgil's play on the cycle is much less direct than his play on the other poems, which we still have today. Even if the cycle was available to Virgil, he didn't need the cycle. He didn't need to read the poems to go meta with them, any more than the makers of the Iliac tablets uh, needed the poems. Uh, Mezentius and Camilla are not copies, after all. They're not copies of Memnon and Penthesilea. They're intertextual hooks for Virgil to hang backstories on, and those backstories are rich and creative. The hatred that Mezentius' countrymen bear for him, the... Um, the story of Camilla being attached to a spear and hurled across a river. This stuff is pure Virgil, and it's far more creative than the torrent of Homeric echoes than you get that you get in Aeneid Book One. Virgil's intertextuality with the epic cycle, or more likely with the prose summaries of the cycle, isn't derivative. It's a it's a testament to his creativity. Well. Here we are. Uh, if you've made it to the end, thanks for listening. I'm going to carry on recording seminars and conference papers that I've given in the past and committing them to YouTube. So I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.